Monday, the 6th of March. The month is going by like that. Now it is noon Eastern time, a special time today. We're trying out a few things. That and the fact that Dan is in Arizona and he will be watching a Padres game today because their manager is a huge Dan Nathan fan. This market call, by the way, brought to you by FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. FactSet is also our data provider. In just a minute, Dan will be joined by the great Carter Braxtonworth, who is not slicked back this time. His hair is a bit askew. Maybe that's due to the early hour. I don't know. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, listen, I would say that the Padres manager, he, he's more of a markets fan. And I got to meet him through a really good friend, Jim Chano. So both of ours. Um, and it's interesting, you know, Bob uh, Melvin, he played in the majors for years and in the off season, because these guys back then, it was a little different guy. You could tell us all about it. You used to wear a tie and jacket to the games back then. Um, but he's actually, he's probably a contemporary of yours. He worked at Bear Stearns in the sure. off season. He was really into markets and, and that's how he met Jim. And I met Bob through Jim and he is a big markets fan actually. And so I told him I was going to be down here and he invited me to the game. I went to one last week. I happened to be here last week. So I'm, I'm a new Padres fan guy. How about As you that? should but, be, and you were sporting a hat earlier. Before we get started, yeah. I saw this comment from Travis Smith before the show started. Uh -oh. So Travis is clearly a bit of an Apple fan, which is fine. I mean, I you know I'm I'm ambivalent about. It. I will tell you, Travis, if you think Apple gives a shit about you, I can assure you they don't. But waiting for the guy Apple is expensive call again, which I've said a number of times. Yet the stock is on a tear. Okay, yeah, I guess Apple is projected to grow faster than McDonald's and Coke, and yet Apple trades at a low. I don't know what the comparison is, but I'll say this. You know, again, Apple over the last seven years or so has probably had half a dozen 30 to 45 percent peak to trough decline. So for those out there that believe this is a, you know, you own it, don't trade it. Think again, number one. And regardless of what anybody thinks, just in terms of the metrics, you know, mid single digits, EPS growth, mid single digit revenue growth. Apple's an expensive stock. Now, you can push back and say, yeah, their user base and services and all that stuff. I, I get it. And Apple was initiated with a $199 price target today at Goldman Sachs. But one thing that I'm pretty cognizant of, um, you know, I don't get married to any of these things. You know, I try to tell it like it is. And if Apple goes to $200, trust me when I tell you, I'll be the first person to come on and say I was wrong. Well, um, but with that said, I mean, you've seen some pretty dramatic moves to the downside. And I didn't want to necessarily start this show with that. But since he commented prior to, I figured I would address it. No, but let, let's <clears throat> let's stay here for a second, because I actually think Apple is to all the points you just made, I think is a really good one. You know, this stock made a new 52 week low below its October lows. This was in January. OK, so like very interesting because, um, you know, I just saw a headline from Jamie Dimon. It came across my fact set machine here um, saying that some of the biggest uh, you know headwinds to the economy is how companies are going to be dealing with the headwinds in Ukraine and China and the fact that he he said China. And, you know, guy, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, Apple, if you think about what they rely on China for demand, what they lie, rely for future growth, what they rely on it from a manufacturing standpoint, um, it's a huge issue. Now, all, all that being said, it overshot to the downside. You know, it kind of overshot the NASDAQ um, in January. And now, you know, here it is. It's at like a big level. It tested its 200-day moving average. It moved above it. I, I would also make the point, man, you think about this stock okay this is a two and a half trillion dollar market cap company they have bought back since 2012 when tim cook came in and instituted a buyback and a dividend they bought back over a half a trillion dollars worth of stock so when you talk about their growth when you talk about their earnings growth it has been massively massively massaged over the last 10 years because they have just basically and and, and it hasn't been greater than, you know, 10% for too many of those years. So again, um, you know, listen, I, I'm, I would have, I would have liked to have bought Apple. We were saying, I know that you had 120 sort of call when the stock was 150, 160 um, on many occasions last year. And this is the hard part, people, is like when you have that opportunity, what does it feel like to do it? And now it doesn't feel particularly great and it is a lot more expensive. All right, guys, let's, um, Let's hit this call from Mike Wilson, and we don't have to get into 
Um, he is the CIO and he's the chief strategist over at Morgan Stanley and he's a friend of ours and we really like his work and he's been really bearish and he's made um, a couple good tactical calls. Well, we made one good one in October um, and now he's making um, another one on the long side here. Um, let's just look. I mean, listen, if you want to go through all the fundamental reasons why and Carter's going to go through the charts a little bit later, but if you just put up our fact set chart right here, I mean, his point and we heard this from some other strategists last week that that was a big test of the 200 day moving average in the S&P last week and it held it and now he thinks it can maybe rally 4150 4200 let's pull up that s p chart our chart really quickly and you know what do you think here is that enough you know basically he's pushing out his fundamental call saying that yes we are going to see the earnings degradation that he expects for the s p 500 but okay but it might have just done what it needed to do technically to get a little bounce back towards those recent highs yeah, so it traded right down to that level, traded to that uptrend line you've been drawing for a while. We thought it could trade the 200-day. I'll say this. I thought it would bounce, but not to the extent that we've seen here. I thought the bounce would be sort of tepid at best. But you've seen a pretty robust bounce in a pretty short amount of time. And Mike's call to 4150 or so, well, hell, I mean, the S&P right now is 4070, I think. So another 80 handles. I mean, we've seen that over the course of a couple of days. So I like the fact that, again, he's trying to remain tactical but having sort of an overall thesis that, you know, the market's probably still in a bit of, bit of trouble here. So I totally get it. And I respect his work as you do, I think. And Carter will look at the charts. But, I mean, the market is trading well. There's no denying that yeah. the market's trading well. But what I will say in the pushback, nothing's really changed. As a matter of fact, I would submit that things are probably getting worse. Two tens have gone out to about 92, 93 basis points on the way to 1%, something we've been saying for a while. That's not particularly bullish. And, you know, the backdrop continues to be difficult and the market, in my opinion, is expensive here, Dan. Yeah, and the NASDAQ looks the same way here. And again, you know, for all of those reasons, you know, uh, Fed Chair Powell is on the Hill this week, he, Tuesday, uh, 10 a.m. in front of Senate. Uh, and then the questions get that much dumber on Wednesday. I'm at 10 a.m. in front of the House. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, let's see what happens. We also have that, that Friday, um, February jobs report mm -hmm. that will be, Really interesting. I want to kind of just kind of skip to the Russell 2000, which we haven't talked about small caps in a little bit of a while. You know, it's funny. We did talk about it with Liz Young this morning on our On the Tape podcast, which is going to drop any moment now, people. So check that out in your favorite podcast store. And she, you know, you know, often looks at the Russell small caps in particular um, as some sort of indication. Doug Cass, our friend over there at Real Money, he sent us an email. It's like our ears were ringing or his ears were ringing a little bit because we were just talking about the Russell. And when you look at the Russell 2000, and you look at how far above it is above its 200 day moving average did not test it last week like the s p the nasdaq doug's comment you can see that in the email that he sent out to um, real money subscribers so check them out over there no one is looking at the divergence between poor performing russell and good performing s p nasdaq it's funny how strategists that were bearish for the first half um, have now turned bullish on price. Price has a way of changing sentiment. Talk to me, guy, a little bit um, about that because, you know, we often hear that expression, trade the market that you have, not the one that you want or this, that, or whatever. Hey, listen, man, I use a multi-input approach here and I'm actually thinking about the market that we're going to have, not mm -hmm. the one that we have right now often. And price, you know, is is obviously changes opinions pretty pretty frequently, but you got to have a lot of inputs here. Yeah, and price does change. Listen, without question, price ch it changes it for a myriad of different reasons, not least of which if you have positions on and things are going against you, at a certain point, the price will get to a level where you're forced to cover regardless of whether or not you think you're right or the fundamentals back up your thesis. So price definitely has a way of changing views without question. And I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. It goes to some of the disciplines that we've talked about. And you know, I don't think Mike Wilson, and I'm not suggesting Doug is saying this, by the way, but I don't think Mike Wilson is changing course here. He's just trying to be tactical uh, in the framework of what he thinks is a continued bear market. So we'll see. The Russell, I think the underperformance, if I'm looking at a few things today, I guess it's a bit concerning. And we traded up to the levels we saw back in August, seemingly have failed. You have that little uptrend line, but the 200-day moving average is really what should come into play at some point. We'll see. You know, I've said a number of times, Dan, and I'm not suggesting I'm right, but I'm of a belief that the Russell sort of leads the broader market by a few weeks to a couple months. And if this thing starts to break down here, you know, maybe that's just in the cards for the broader market. And we'll see. But, but I think Doug is right to bring up the underperformance of the Russell in the context of what's going on in the broader market today.
Yeah, and the the other thing, <clears throat> other than the data we're going to get this week and Fed Chair Powell speaking, um, we got to look at you know uh, President Xi over in China and what he had to say um, over there. I mean, obviously, um, you know the about face that they did on zero COVID in January. It was something that I think a lot of you know strategists, economists um, expected um, at some point in 2023. I don't think they expected the speed um, in which it happened, just the turn, and you know stocks uh, at you know the October lows. I mean. Look at what the FXI, that's the iShares uh, large mm -hmm. cap, China ETF did off the lows. I mean, we were up probably, what, close to 20% um, at our highs off the October lows. And you look at the FXI, it was up about 60%. Some of the largest holdings in there are Tencent, Alibaba, Medawan, um, JD, Baidu. So a lot of um, uh, digital names, the, uh, you know, the, the, the CCP had already cracked down aggressively right on a lot of those tech companies and i think that was kind of built into the sentiment a little bit but she's putting out a, a, like maybe maybe a five percent target gdp i think a lot of economists were expecting five and a half percent i think the average from 2015 15 to pre-pandemic was about 6.7 percent so again you know if you were relying on china as the engine of growth or reflation globally um they just sent a lower bar or set a lower bar than many would have expected thoughts just on that thoughts on basically you know um you've been uh you know someone who's pointed out as a way to play china it's just Alibaba, you know, when, when you think about it, and you had a great call, I think, off the lows in the fall. Are these stocks interesting to you? Because they're not that interesting to me, given what I think our collective geopolitical outlook is for China. Yeah, let's pull up Alibaba real quick, if we can take a look. You know, I remember we talked about it was the weekend in October, and I want to say it was the weekend of the 15th or something. Don't at me if I'm wrong, but it was a big is China invest uninvestable. Those were the headlines. And actually, on that Monday at Fast Money, that's how we led the show. And something that I said, and I you know, was just watching the way Alibaba was trading, I said, look, I said, if you're looking for a tell, Alibaba's been in a downtrend for two years, but we have seen over the course of time, if you do a longer term chart, you'll see what I'm talking about. You've seen 30 to 50% bounces off the low in this stock that's been in a very significant downtrend. And I said, given the volume we saw, the stock traded to 58 and change intraday, closed at 63. I said, Here's another one of those setups. Well, the stock went from 63 to 118, 120. It's interesting that Ryan Cohen, I think on January 26th, and don't at me if I'm off by a day, that was the day that he announced his stake, his foray into Alibaba. And you can look at this chart and you see what happened since. I mean, it's gone from basically the high teens, 120, down to, I think, 87 or so. It's 90 now. So to answer your question, they're trading vehicles, and that's really it. I don't think... I'm going to give you the all clear sign yet in Alibaba because I don't think you've seen that capitulation to the downside. But I look at these in terms of just opportunities to trade stocks. And these have been Alibaba specifically has really been a great one over the last couple of years. Yeah, you've also identified, you know, the China reopening as an opportunity to trade crude oil. Um, and so let's just pull that one up really quickly. Um, and then let's get to Carter here because he has been patiently waiting early on a Monday for us here. And this one, you know, a series of kind of higher lows here. You see the resistance. It's in and around that uh, $80 level. You see where the 200-day moving average is. I mean, at some point, you would expect if the China story is for real, um, that to break out. But you you much prefer, it sounds like, trading the stocks, the, the large integrateds or the OAH? They've held in there. I mean, quick before we get to Carter, OAH, I think it's trading 330 or so. I mean, it's It's been hanging in there extraordinarily well under the backdrop of a market that's gone you know, sideways to slightly lower, slightly higher over the course of a couple of weeks. Obviously, a commodity that hasn't done all that much, but these all service names are hanging in there. We need to get through these levels. I mean, you would say, look, this is a level you have to sell it. We failed here a number of times and you'd be right. And the fact that we're now probably a standard deviation or two away from the 200-day moving average is concerning. And we've clearly seen sell-offs in these names over the last year, year and a half. But I'm still of the belief that if you can just close your eyes, which is obviously not the best way to trade, and just say, I still believe in the thesis here. I think these all-service names specifically, but energy and sort of more macro broadly still work in this environment. Yeah, I mean, listen, it would take something like very severe fundamentally, I think, for this thing to like meaningfully break down and test that 200 day. But but if you're telling me there's fundamental catalysts out there back and fill, you play ultimately for that um, that breakout. I think Carter would say the more times it tests that resistance, probably mm -hmm. the greater likelihood it is to break out. All right, let's do it. Carter, 
Braxton Worth of Worth Charting. Um, thank you for being Man. so patient, Carter. How are you? I'm you had there's a, there's a couple things that I want you <clears throat> or we need you, our audience needs you to help us with here. I think that S&P chart, um, you know, listen, we watch Mike. Um, he does great work. And I think it was interesting, though, that he's putting in one of these little tactical bull calls based on a technical level in the S&P. And then the other thing we really want to focus on, because I actually think this is part of it. You had a report out, which was epic on worth charting. People go to worthcharting.com, check it out. Um, and in your universe of 1,700 stocks that you were screening for certain patterns, you had about 10% that were going to bearish to bullish reversals. And we're going to hit a few of the big ones here. Um, but let's start with the S&P 500. And you just saw it. We pulled up a nice little looking fact set chart here. But you do you do a little bit more in-depth work than the well, guy. You know, I mean, look, everyone's entitled and should be drawing their lines and trying to uh, respect price action. Uh, there's wisdom in price. The government knows this. The government includes stock prices in their leading indicator index. Um, and whether one is coming at it from a quantitative point of view, a technical point of view, a fundamentals point of view, the valuation of the market, um, judgments have to be made. Um, in, in terms of short-term calls, uh, no, I mean, look, Mike has nothing to do with Mike. I've worked on the street longer, long as Mike, and I've worked with strategists who are high ranked number one as he is now. I've been in that category in 10 years. The clients don't actually care about the calls for one and 2% moves. They just don't, right? Just remember that if you were to look at the total short interest as a percentage of the float of all U.S. listed stocks, the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, the Amex, it's basically 3%. The broad swath of money is long. Right, all the big endowments and all the big synagogues and all the big churches, all the big museums and all the big colleges—they're long. Now they might have stuff on the side and they have higher hedge managers, but nobody cares when you're running a large cap growth fund at T Row and Fidelity. You think it'll go up two percent from here? You think that—it's—it's it's good, and some people might be interested. But what we have to figure out, Mike is trying to figure out, and that's his more important conclusion: Does the market have a lot of upside? And so when a prominent strategist comes out and says you can get two percent from here. The real takeaway is not that it's going up 2%. It shows right. how little he thinks of the market, which is to say he thinks the market's got much more downside risk than it has upside potential. And quickly to that point, it Dan. You, it takes I'm, you to that line. I mean, he can right. draw lines too, and that's what he's doing. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Carter. Was was gonna say was... The line is 2% higher from here. Yeah, and to that point, you know, I want to emphasize he's not, he's not changing his thesis. I mean, he's not making a pivot here. I just think he's... Right. Again, it's a tactical call, and we can debate whether or not he should be making that tactical call, but it's tactical call within the framework of his work, which still suggests that he sees lower over the course of time. Anyway, back to you, okay. Dan. Yeah, no, and and again, you know, um, this thing is getting narrower and narrower, though, Carter, when you think about, like, the tension that's building, right? And so I think what I like about Mike's call here, it, it helps you kind of flesh out his thought process about the fundamental view that he has. He has a view that we are going to start to see aggressive S&P earnings degradation, okay, um, once we get further into the year because we're going to have the lag effects of those rate increases. And he's saying in the near term, holding that moving average, getting a sense for sentiment here, you know what I mean? The fact that <clears throat> the Fed is likely to be slowing the pace of increases, which we all know, right? And therefore, if you think about what the Fed has priced in or Fed funds have priced in, for it used to be cuts at the end of this year. Now it's really no cuts for all intents and purposes. He's just kind of pushing out that sort of retest of the October sure. lows. So again, I think it's interesting. Talk to us though, again. I mean, let's look, yeah. I have two iterations here. Let's leave this one. These these lines mean nothing. I, I, I include them for a reason. Anyone can connect any two points. To have a proper trend or authority to a trend line, six touch points, eight, four, at least three, this is just two points touching two points. Um, look at the next iteration, which is one. So is that the bullish interpretation where that's more touch points? That's four. And now after overshooting, we've checked back to it, held to the penny and bounced. But if you just toggle back and forth, one iteration, the other iteration, one. If you had no lines, the truth is we're not progressing, nor have we frankly deteriorated. And we are up off the October low. But the market is churning because Everything that's immediately at risk, both or potential, is out of the way to some extent. Earnings, the big one, is basically out of the way, right? Um, 
there's no news on the war front that's kind of out of the way. Uh, the Fed is spoken and people are kind of getting the idea that, hey, they're not going to go forever. And so it's all, but then you've got the, the Mike Wilson earnings um, premise that they'll be weak. So the, the truth of it is that it's kind of a pair of twos. It's not yeah. really, which leaves you with the opportunity to find not the aggregate, but individual picks within the aggregate. Well, I mean, we're going to get to that because your work on the, the bearish to bullish reversals. And the thing that's crazy is, you know, I have a main board on fact set with hundreds of stocks broken down by sector. And if you just look at the gains of the names that just, you know what I mean, that are on my board versus an S&P that's up 6% on the year or 6.5% and NASDAQ that's up double that. I mean, you think we're in a raging bull market. You think that it's just, you know, QE forever again. And guy, I mean, like, that's the thing that's really hard because the further we get in the year and you know we've heard all that data about two consecutive down years how infrequent it is and you know all that sort of stuff you know I, i'm just curious because going back to the comment from doug is like how price has the mm -hmm. potential to change sentiment and when you think about sentiment we talk about consumer sentiment we talk about um you know um you know business small business sentiment all this sort of stuff those are the those are the things that cause companies to like cut costs, whether it be CapEx or jobs or that sort of thing. And so, you know, it, it's been an elusive recession that that everyone was convinced last year was coming. The stock market was convinced about it and it hasn't come yet. And the stock market, at least the lens in which we look through it this year is saying a different story than I think what you and I believe right now. No, absolutely. And again, going back to the price as a way of changing. I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, price does. But at a certain point, I think Carter would agree with this as well. I mean, sometimes price changes the technical outlook of things as well. And quite frankly, so much of this market and so much of individual stocks trade on technical. So if you can get things to certain levels, it will change the dynamic of the market, whether we think that's justified or not. And in terms of, you know, the fundamental outlook, you know, one thing that I keep coming back to is I don't think the economy nor the market has felt the impacts of basically five percent rate hikes over the last 10 or so months i think the market talks about it but i don't think the market is fully taken into consideration or felt the impact of such and you know there's this lag effect that i think we're on the precipice of and i think it was julian emmanuel last week or two weeks ago on fast money said something to the effect of you know we're still working through the amount of uh, liquidity that was in the system for such a long period of time so there's a lot of truth to that i think when the market and the in the when the market and the economy start feeling it, that's when these things will start really manifesting themselves right before our eyes. So I'm surprised, obviously, that we haven't felt it yet, but it doesn't mean we're not going to feel it at some yeah. point. All right. Well, so, so talking about some of the names in which um, are starting to. Um you know, just kind of do a turn here in a way where like they probably corrected much earlier than the major indices did. Um, but Carter, you, you've done some work. You had um, over a hundred names that you identified. You're going to bring a few here and we're going to ping you on a couple other names that are on our radar, but you call them bearish to bullish um, reversals here. Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in the chart, because that group of stocks that you put in the report today are about 10%, right, of this 1,700 or 1,600 right. that you were screening for these sorts of patterns. So we, we start typically, if we can, with the broadest universe available. The Russell 3000 represents 98% of the investable U.S. equity market. And if you just eliminate stocks under 400 million, just to get rid of things that are too small, the list shrinks to 2,531. If you eliminate stocks with less than 150,000 in average volume every day, it drops down to about 2,000. And then you want average daily volume of at least 10 million, and that gets you to about 1,700. And that's the universe that we typically will work up. One could say, but I like small cap $50 million stocks. They're great, but you know most clients can't uh, traffic and things like that. So from a universe of 1,700, we singled out, not because we wanted it to be a 10%, but just going through each one, one out of 10 um, is characterized as a bearish to bullish reversal. This is known in the street as a rounding bottom or bottoming out formation. Uh, but the bearish to bullish reversal moniker, I got that from my teacher mentor, is really a more accurate description. It was something that was proceeding in a deep, severe downtrend, bearish, that is transitioning, reversing from bear to bull. 
And we do that by trying to see where the moving average turns. But you can see on the screen here, and this is the important thing, do those stocks have anything to do with one another? And one could say, yeah, they're all new tech, but they really aren't. One's for signing things, one's for lending money, isn't it? So if I, and one is, uh, is for billing. But the correlations are running at 80, 90% for a reason, because it's all about money flow. You could, none of them probably are particularly cheap. None of them, some of them might not even make any money. But, but, they, but stocks move because money moves into them. And so the point of showing you this comparative chart is just how similar they are, um, which is to say we're trying to catch moves in the market, themes in the market, not, uh, we're not buying income statements and balance sheets. That doesn't work over time. But anyway, let's, for fun, let's do a little bit of a movie. Let's start with just one. There's DocuSign. Let's add another. Let's add the third. You start to wonder. Now put in the S&P for fun. So what do we do here? This is where there's a prospect for alpha generation. Do we mm -hmm. buy that black line? Or do we find something that has the precondition of shocking weakness, 60, 80% down, that now is doing better than the market? So you've got the old one-two punch, something that was really, really bad, which you don't want, but then is better. Which, so something that's really, really bad and stays bad, that's called Enron. WorldCom, Eastman Kodak, going out of business, thank you for playing, you lose all your money. But you want something that has that precondition but starts to emerge and turn. It's the, it's the Rocky Balboa, so everyone loves a comeback. These are stocks that are turning. And there could be others. You could put Peloton on here. You could put any number of stocks. Um, the list is 175 names, but these are prototypical of the phenomenon known as a bearish to bullish reversal buy. It's interesting, Carter. I mean, quickly before we sort of Audi 5000, does that mean anything? I guess everything at a certain point is mean reverting. And I think your suggestion is we're going to probably see that. But again, I've asked you this question before. Is the, correla is the correlation such that all these stocks rally against a broader market that goes nowhere? Or is there going to be some basically, you know, push me, pull you, broader market sells off, these stocks get off the mat? Or these are the things that keep the market moving up a bit more. Right. There is these are the there's, there's a lot of mm -hmm. autocorrelation and you that's why people spend a lot of time looking at aggregates that are equal weight or give me the S and P X tech and these are ways to slice and dice the data to try to tease out the true nuggets of wisdom. But from my point of view, at any given time, um, the way to figure out the market is to study where momentum is most um, sort of prominent. And trying to study Walmart here is a waste of time. Costco is a waste of time. There's nothing that those two stocks among any or many could do here that will inform us. But if and as these all continue to bottom, animal spirits are on. There's momentum. There's money flow. If these falter, some have earnings come up, there's a message there too. We're trying to use certain stocks at certain times as a control mechanism for the market. Sometimes it's big banks, uh, right? And sometimes it's tech or NASDAQ 100. Right now, it's beaten up names that are emerging from nightmare scenarios. So Carter, you deal with a lot of clients who use your technical work as a input to their process, okay? And, and I would say that that is, is often how I view technical analysis. I find it a very important um, input for a whole host of reasons. You like using a lot of relative strength. You, you have a lot of stuff that I've learned from you over the last 12 years that, that you and I have been doing CNBC together, and I saw your work before that. Um, and to me, it's just really part of a process. But so when I look at Square or Block, however you want to call it, and I look at this company and I look at one of the reasons why a lot of companies that had similar characteristics that SoFi included, and just, you know, I'm long SoFi and I'm long PayPal, one of Square's or Block's main um, competitors. I bought it the week before last. When I look at PayPal, I'd much rather... That stock on the technical basis looks very similar to me than a square. And then if I put together the fundamentals, okay, here's a good just example. You know, they both have really good um, balance sheets. They both have a lot of cash. They have some debt here. Um, but when I look at PayPal, they have about 49% gross margins versus, let's say, square at 36. Um, you know, square might be growing a little faster, but 
you know, PayPal is much more, I mean, it is just legit profitable. They're going to do $30 billion in sales and have $4 billion in gap net income this year, where Square is expected to do $20 billion in sales and actually be on a gap basis unprofitable. You know, like, so I use a bunch of inputs um, like that. So I'm curious, is that interesting to you when you have clients push back at you or people that you know in the business and say, hey, listen, I see what you see on Square, but I see the same thing in this competitor. And here are all these fundamental reasons. Does that have any um, input to you as an individual, not the way you're doing your quantitative work on, on these sectors and on these individual names on a relative basis. I'm just curious, does that hold weight to you? Uh, I mean, look, it, it, it comes up uh, very rarely. Here's why. I'll give you a standard thing. I sort of, I started uh, in the world of Q's and K's. I was fundamentally this for about yep. three years. But the, the, the clients uh, that I've interacted for, with for decades, they they're they're doing that and they're using my work as an overlay some use it as idea generation then they'll go investigate some use it as confirmation oh, he doesn't like it maybe we should cut it back but what happens at this point you know you can't teach an old dog new tricks i'm 56 years old someone who's younger on a team might say well some of the things that you introduce and then the lead pme please carter doesn't care about that <laughs> don't bring that up meaning they're there because because i don't see because if i did and this is important i would be compromised i just yeah look at price. Not to say that anything you didn't say is valid. It could be very valid. One might be better uh, you know, than the other. One, one have more uh, free cash flow coming. One have better growth prospects. One have, might have more debt. One has better exposure to this. One has less competition with Stripe that's coming up. All of which is in principle um, uh, the information that, uh, that people act on. But what, what, I, what I'm trying to do, it's what a bookie is doing. right? The bookie is just following the line, right? watching the flow yeah. of money. And uh, PayPal is also has the elements of a bearish to bullish reversal. It's just that at this point, it's still below its 150 day moving average. And I typically want them to be above that. Well, that, that, I mean, that's a great answer. And, and again, what, one of the reasons why I asked you that question is we're trying to tease it out. A lot of our viewers, you know, they, they use a whole host of different inputs. Right. Some just trade purely on technical, some trade on momentum, some trade on, only on fundamentals. And you hear from people all the time who say, I don't look at charts. I don't work for me. I don't know. So I, I think that's interesting. All right, last one before we get out of here. Last week, I think it was, I told you I bought some calls in April in Snap. Um, and, and maybe it was like a so bad, it's good sort of situation here. And I gave you fundamental reasons why I was looking to do that. Okay. And you gave me the double thumbs up here. Well, here it is. This thing is approaching that, um, that I think it's a 200 that we have here, but the 150, well, it's above it now. Um, so look at that level going back to that gap in the spring, right? When we mm -hmm. had, um, you know, I guess it was over the summer, that sort of thing. I mean, what do you think of this one now? Because I just rolled the calls. I was long April 12th and I rolled them to the June 13s for about the same price. And I could really see this thing headed back to 20 over the course of uh, this year. That would be that kind of breakdown level or just above it from May. Yeah. I mean, I like it even more, right? So one could say, what do you mean? It's up 10%. You like it more. It, you usually get what you pay for. You want to pay up. And so let me, maybe you guys are always talking about sports. Let me say something I've said to people early on when they, you like this. People are saying, well, no, I don't want to chase it. I missed it. I, I, I don't want to pay up. I, they're waiting always for a deal. So here's what you get what you pay for. Cheap handbags, cheap shoes. You get cheap handbags. But they're really, in sports, it's this. If I said, guys, guys, I've got an idea. Guy, and then let's start a baseball team. And we're going to hire a bunch of $400,000 players. We're, we're going to get cheap. You know what you get? You get the bad news bears. You get nothing. Now, if you pay up like the Yankees, you get the Yankees. You pay up in life. You get what you pay for. Snap is better now than it was, and it was good last week. Well, and under that, Dan, I would be the Kelly Leak of our Bad News Bears, and you guys can be <laughs> whomever you want to be. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Dubs, once again, always bringing it. Thanks for your work. Again, these bearish to bullish reversals, the ones that you flagged, Carter's worth, Carter Worth's work is invaluable, and you folks should all check it out. So thanks, CBW. Obviously, Dan coming from Arizona, going to watch a Padres. Uh, they call that the Grapefruit League or the Cactus League, I should Cactus say. Cactus League. Right there. Well, just just so you know, it's interesting that that Carter brought up, um, you know, basically Moneyball there. Carter, Bob Melvin, who's the the coach of the or manager of the Padres, last year was his first year after being at the uh, Oakland A's for 10 years. Okay. So 10 years in that, you know, like the prior that I think he was the longest standing manager of the A's um, ever. And I think that obviously he was brought up under the Billy Bean um, money ball situation. And it seemed to only work 
for Billy Bean and the Oakland A's. And then everyone else had to get in the arms race that you speak about, um, right? As far as the Yankees, right. the Red Sox, and some of these other teams that have just gone um, big Well, ball. Padres are involved in that arms race, too. If you look at some of the contracts on that Manny roster, so good Oof. for them. That's going to be fun. Thanks, CBW. Yeah. Um, Thanks, team. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Thanks to the audience, always. I want to thank FactSet, Financial Data and Analytics, powered by Tamar. They're also our data provider, Tomorrow, I'm back. Check this out, folks. Regular time, 1 p.m., but it's going to be yours truly and the great Danny Moses of Big Short fame. So check us out. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Uh -huh.